Okay, everybody, welcome back to uh, the Bandwidth Kaleidoscope Here's And once again, I have my good friend, uh, James Corbett, who, if you don't know, is a actually well-known podcaster who just got his one of his YouTube channels deleted um, because he was telling the truth about geopolitics, but that's a thing. Anyway, James, hi. Hey, <laughs> on a happier note, <laughs> let's get back to the Beatles. <laughs> let's get back to the Beatles. Always a happy note with the Beatles. And uh, yeah, so uh, today, uh, please please me. And uh, as usual, James, why don't you give us a little kind of feeling about uh, the context and the historical, you know, little details about the song in general. Sure, gladly. Well, um, first of all, let's just remind anyone who might be tuning in for the first time uh, that we are going through the songs, the so the, all the songs of the Beatles eventually. I'm sure we'll hit them all eventually. Uh, but right now we're going through the singles in chronological order, and we have alighted upon Please Please Me, which was recorded on the 11th of September, interestingly, and the 26th of November, 1962. Can I ask you a quick question yes. about the song? Um, was this song the first hit in America by the Beatles? Like, was, was this the first song to be a hit in America? In America? Well, you will know more about America than I will. I would assume that uh, hold, no, I Want to Hold Your Hand was the breakthrough hit in America. Well, it might have been the breakthrough hit, yeah, yeah, okay. I think yeah. Please Please Me was released and didn't do anything. Uh, I Know She Loves You was released and didn't do anything, right? Yeah, 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 I think so. Actually, I'm bad on that part of the history, but yeah. Well, anyway, they had a couple of singles that they had tried to release, but I, as far as I know, I Want to Hold Your Hand was the breakthrough hit in America. In England, this certainly was their first number one, and it was the thing that got them... Definitely attention. Um, mm -hmm. So, let's get a little bit of the background and the context. Uh, from Revolution in the Head. Uh, oh, sorry, I've lost the page. There we go. John Lennon wrote Please Please Me at his Aunt Mimi's house, taking the first line of Bing Crosby's 30s hit, Please, as a starting point for a mid-tempo solo ballad in the doomily climactic style of Roy Orbison, which is a good way of describing it. And for anyone who needs that elaborated, uh, of course, Paul does a version of that in uh, his recounting of the song in the anthology, where he shows what it was like when John brought it to them. Uh, you know, uh, come on, come on, come on, please, please. You know, you could imagine. You could yeah, you could very much hear a Roy Orbison rendition of this, couldn't you? Uh, tried out at the end of the final session for Love Me Do, uh, it intrigued George Martin without seeming to him to be finished. Uh, still skeptical of Lennon and McCartney's songwriting capacities, <laughs> he suggested that they speed it up, rearranging it for harmonized voices, which is an interesting part of the song that I think I will have something to say about and perhaps ask about. Um, turning to the Beatles Bible, uh, producer George, George Martin persuaded the Beatles to rearrange the song, which duly became their first number one single. And then quoting John Lennon, uh, we've had a top 30 entry with Love Me Do and we really thought we were on top of the world. Then came Please Please Me and wham, we tried to make it as simple as possible Mission successful, I would say. Some of the stuff we've written in the past has been a bit way out, but we aimed this one straight at the hit parade. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I think it shows. Um, just personally, just on the general note of this song, I would say this is clearly their first step toward what they would become, I think. This is the sort of a statement song of where they were going. And we talked about this in our discussion of P.S. I Love You where P.S. I Love You, to me, sounds like it's on the kind of the 50s side of the 60s, right. where it's, it right. sounds old. It sounds old, mm -hmm. whereas their, yeah. their stuff after that point sounded fresher, newer, modern, whatever. I think this is that first step into that modern sound. And I don't know, I couldn't put my finger on what exactly about this song makes it that way, but perhaps you can elaborate. Good observation, by the way. And, by, and also, by the way, uh, George Martin... Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, what's his name? Ian McDonald, a Revolution in the Head. I think he's being kind here because I read a quote from George Martin saying, uh, you know, that basically the first couple of songs that John and Paul uh, gave to me were crap. That's the way he put it. He did not like them. However, when he offered the suggestion of speeding that song up, uh, Please Please Me, uh, that's when he announced to them after they recorded, gentlemen, you have your first hit before it was actually a hit. Um, 
So well, actually, yeah. That that um, McDonald goes on to say that um, apart from request, uh, so he he talks about the fact that the uh, the specter of uh, how do you do it is still hanging over the Beatles. That George still wants them to record this. So they worked really right. hard on this rewrite, apparently, uh-huh. uh, that he requested for them. And when they yeah. came back with it, and then they recorded it, it says apart from requesting a harmonica overdub doubling Harrison's guitar riff, a delighted George Martin had little to add. Congratulations, gentlemen, he said, pressing the control room intercom button after the final take. You've just made your first number one. Uh, That he was right is less remarkable than that someone of his age and background should have understood music as new and rough-hewn as the Beatles well enough to see that emphasizing its quirks would improve it. Which is a good observation. Uh, Then again, we do tend... I still tend to think of George Martin as... The adult in the room, he's so much... He's only a few years older than them. He's not like right, some exactly. 40-year-old grizzled veteran or something. He's he's still pretty young himself at this point. He was in, like, his early 30s, maybe? Was I think late 20s, I think. I'll, oh I'll look God. that up. Maybe, anyway, <laughs> certainly not not more than a decade older than that's for sure. But he had the suit on, and he was a representation of the man. So, yeah, yeah. Which kind of stayed with the Beatles throughout their career. Bothers me, because... Clearly, I, I mean, I think it's really obvious that George Martin was a musical visionary without question. The fact that he could hear this song as a hit alone is testament to that. Okay, I, I better correct this for all the uh, the Beatles fans out there that will be annoyed at me. No, more, George Martin was born in 1926, so he would have been about 37. Yes, okay, oh, he was. Wow, he was definitely old. the grizzled oh, old veteran. Oh, all my right. God. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Anything else about the historical context? We, we have an idea. Of yeah, I think that establishes it. Yes, basically, this was one of the very, very early things they recorded. Not the earliest, but one of the early. They're still fresh in the studio and um, still very receptive to whatever George Martin has to say. And as I think McDonald contextualizes it there, yes, they do not want to record this other song. So they really worked hard on this one. And as John Lennon said, they aimed it straight at the hit parade and they hit their mark, at least in the UK. Wow. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, Yeah. All right. So let's talk about uh, the music theory and all that kind of stuff then. Um, As usual, a big picture, just a big wide view of the song. Let's talk about the form. Uh, So it has its introduction. The... uh And it's very interesting that they use this, they pepper it throughout the song in different ways. It's not always the same statement. Uh, which is talk about aiming for for pop stardom with the song. That's a hook right there. That's what they call in the music industry a hook. That thing that sticks in your mind when you hear a song. Uh, so they really, really played that up. But they did it as always with taste. It was not uh, bashing you over the head the way some musical artists will do. Uh, so the form of this is we have our intro, we have our verse, which is kind of the verse and the chorus are kind of like stuck together at the hip. You wouldn't want to separate them. So A, the verse, goes into B, the chorus. They're stuck together. So we have our intro, A, B, then A, B again with a little mini tag in the middle. Then we have C, a bridge. Then we have A, B, and out to the coda. Very, very simple. And again, it follows a trajectory, a trajectory I like to see as this kind of arc where it goes like up, 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 and then back down. But it's reaching towards something, which in this case would be the C section, the bridge, building up energy toward that bridge. And one thing I always, always say about Beatles music of this era, listen to it with a different ear. Listen to it just for the energy behind it. And, you know, you can feel their passion, their love, their excitement. It's just really palpable. All right, so uh, let me call up, uh, I'm going to call up the lead sheet for this song so you can see what the chords are. So here's the chord chart for the song. We have four bars intro on just an E chord, and that would be the underlining part for the... Then the verse starts, last night I said these words to my girl. And so we have our A section there. Our B section there, we have a first ending, which means we do this once when we come here, follow the repeat sign back and go through again. But this time we go here. And each time is an iteration of that. Da, 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 da. Um, 
this line. Da, da, da. When we open up the song, they just stay on the E chord. Da, 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 da. But when we get to here, they, they throw the four and five chords in, so we get da, 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 da. right? The second time around, it goes. Um, so we get that little touch of it, but then right at that cut, Ringo does a little fill. And then we go into our bridge. I don't want to start complaining, but you know there's always raining. I do all the things you it's so hard to read Oh, yeah, why do you make me go? And again, that tag is at the end of that C section. Da, 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 da. So they get it again over there. Uh, and it says the direction goes, uh, take verse to the coda. So we follow through the verse here and uh, into the chorus, but it says last time to coda. So this is our last time doing the chorus. So we jump to coda, which is over here. All right, so. Uh, 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 come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Now jump into the coda. Please, 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 oh yeah, like I please, 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 oh yeah, like I please, 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 oh yeah, like I please, please. And a straight E chord on this, not their, their sixth chord. Right. All right, so that's the general form of the song. All right, now, <clears throat> There are two things to look at here. First of all, the the if you notice, James, the, the chord progression itself is nothing too surprising. It's all chords that come out of the key of E. Yeah, I was going to say, nothing has ever E'd as hard in the history of Enus than this song, except for the G, which is clearly part of the Aeolian Ascent, to lead us up to the okay. 5 to bring us back to the 1. Interestingly, uh, good, good observation, right? So... Um, here we have that G chord showing up in the middle of a verse. And then we have it show up at the end as if to say there was a reason for that G. Yeah, and, and it goes to it the is. C. Right. Which is interesting. Yes, it is interesting. And that's going to lead me to, if you don't mind me indulging myself here, James, <laughs> uh, remember we were talking about the circle of fifths and when you split it in half, what happens? You get... Secondary dominance on one side, tritone subs on the other. I, I want to go into that, and I made up a special uh, circle of fifths where E is at the top rather than C, so we could do it in that context. Um, all right, so let's let's look at this G and C and see where they're coming from. Off the off the top of my head, immediately. Uh, I wouldn't think so much as of the Aeolian Ascent as I would think of the parallel relative switch yet once again. And by the way, I decided for the show notes, I'm going to, rather than me have to explain over and over again what the parallel relative switch is and what secondary dominance and tritone substitutions are, I'm going to put up pages from my book that you could link to and read about what are secondary dominance, what are tritone substitutions, and what is the parallel relative switch so we can get there. So I'm going to assume the knowledge here uh, for most of our listeners, okay? And by the way... Just to complicate yeah. things just that little bit further, I seem to recall that we've reached the conclusion that the parallel relative switch was just one form of the... Or the alien ascent was one form of the parallel relative switch. It Yeah, it shows up, but it has to be in a certain format. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. In other words, if we're in E, the alien ascent would have to be C, D, E. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking of this, it's going to the five, which then resolves back to the one, right? Right. 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 Okay. So, all right, let's look at these charts I, I put together today and my mad rush to uh, have some notes for this song. Once I got into it, yeah, as with any Beatles song, it's like, you, like I didn't expect much from this. I really didn't. And the more I got into it, I went, holy cow, I'm going to show you something about this song that's like, how did they know? It's always that question about the Beatles. How did they know to do this? Um, 
And by the way, just quick side parenthetical, shout out to Michael. I'm sorry I don't uh, have your last name, but uh, he's a new student of mine who found my YouTube videos and liked them so much that he decided he wanted lessons for me, and he comes out of the UK. So, uh, all right. So anyway, let's take a look at this circle of fifths. Now, here's the standard circle of fifths, the way it always is without all the extra stuff. I, I didn't put in the relative minors in this area, anything like that. Now, you notice there's a red line, dotted line, splitting it down the center. In the key of C, these chords to the right, at, including C itself, and the other five chords to the right, are secondary dominant functions, or five to one functions of the key of C. So, in other words, if I took C and turned it to C7, it would resolve to the F chord in the key of C. G is proprietary to the key of C, but it acts just like a secondary dominant. So in this case, we put it in the category of secondary dominant. G as a seventh chord resolves to C. D as a seventh chord resolves to G. A as a seventh chord resolves to D, E to A, and B to E. Now, if we were to kind of get all picky and fussy about uh, one of the chords of the key of C itself, we have the G chord, the D would be D minor, the A would be A minor, and the E would be E minor, the B would be diminished, and the F would be uh, the, major. a major, yeah. right? Um, so there's that. However, the cool thing is that these can all be made into major chords, which then would act as if they were seventh chords. It doesn't matter if they're seventh or major, they both do the same thing, okay? So this is the list of, of dominant seventh chords that would resolve to chords within the key of C. I've just shown that. G goes to C, D goes to G, blah, blah, blah. On this side is the list all the way down to uh, G flat are tritone substitution chords that can resolve to chords in the key of C, but in a different way than the five to one relationship. And how this is a cool way of finding where are the secondary dominants, where are the tritone substitutions, and how can I substitute a secondary dominant with a tritone substitution? And the way that happens is you don't want the standard sound of G going to C, right? To find the secondary dominant, you go 180 degrees of chord, uh, not the secondary. G G is the proprietary seventh chord of the key of, G, of C. If I wanted to replace it with a, a tritone substitution, all I have to do is go 180 degrees of core across and replace G with D flat. So the sound uh, D minor to G to C would be this. And D minor to D flat to uh, C would be this. So obviously you're getting much more color from the tritone substitution chord, okay? Uh, so if you have A7, let's say, let's do another example. A7 would resolve to D minor in the key of C. So that'd be. And then, right. Uh, so let's look at its tritone substitution, E flat. So we get. Uh, as opposed to the more kind of ragtimey, old fashioned. big color difference, okay? So now, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna do the same thing, but since we're in the key of E, I'm gonna turn this circle of fifths with E at the top. And you're gonna notice some differences, here it is, is you notice in the prior one, we had all flat chords here. But since the key of E is a major key, these have to be described enharmonically switched. So B flat, is the same as A sharp. E flat is the same as D sharp. A flat is the same as G sharp. And those are the chords you're going to find here, all the sharp chords. All right. Now, what once were tritone substitutions in the key of C now become in the key of E. These are all the secondary dominant chords. Okay. And these are the tritone substitution chords. Now we can notice. Uh, actually, I want to show you one thing back in C. It's easier to think in C. If I were to start on B, well, going in this direction, 
is not a circle of fifths, it's a circle of fourths. B, one, two, three, four, B, C, D, E, B, C, D, E, one, two, three, four, E, F, G, A, one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D, one, two, and so on and so forth. And it keeps going like that. All right, now if we go to the key of E, here's our G chord. So obviously it's plucked from the tritone substitution category, although it's in this case, it really isn't acting like a tritone sub. It's acting as a, as a more bluesy type of thing, and that would relate to the parallel relative switch. But still, when we come to the ending, what's interesting is just like you can do in the key of C, the cir this is called a circle of force. Listen to the circle of force starting on B and eventually resolving to C. So B to E to A to D to G to C. Right? Now, the interesting thing about tritone substitutions is that you could pull the same movement in force if you want to, and that's what happens at the ending. He, they go E, G, C, B, E. Now, interestingly, we could have, they chose the B chord. Are you, are you with me on this? Yeah, can, so can you play that just so I can hear it? The E to G to C to B? Uh, obviously the ending. And again, great, great classic Beatles ending that really that kind of ending is like if you use more jazz chords, it would be a jazz thing. It, it would totally be a jazz. Is thing. there, can you think of a, a prehistory for that ending in pop music? Can you think of any precedence to that, that they were working from? Only if you go to the more advanced pop music of like the forties, they might've had that because those were all jazz guys in the forties that were writing at that point. It's funny. Cause today when I was re-listening to this song in preparation, I was listening to that ending, and I, I love that ending. It's it's so definitive. It's such a statement. It really brings it together. And I realized, I remember like a year ago or something like that, I, I once brought up in a lesson um, the ending of this Zwan song. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, that I'm like, I love that ending, that sound of it. It's just, it's so energetic in the way that it ends. And I now realize mm -hmm. that is exactly that and I haven't I, I didn't look at the chords so I'll have to look it up but it's probably the exact same movement in the exact same way stated with the the same kind of drum fill wow. kind of thing because uh -huh. it, it and and now I realize yeah it definitely came from please please me so I'm wondering where they got it from because it's so it's such ah. a beautiful ending it's a great great it's so elegant yeah <laughs> Because it, it takes you out of the gravity well you're in and suddenly brings you back in. You yeah, because as I say, uh, this song, this whole song is so E. Everything is, it. there's no real surprises. And then at the end, they throw that in. Yeah, and again, one of the things that makes the Beatles great is just those simple little touches that change everything around. You know? I want to show you the extent of what's possible with stuff like this now. Uh, we have E, G, C, B, all right? Uh, now, of course, the E itself cannot be tritone substituted or yeah, it can't be tritone substituted because it's our root chord. You want to go home to that. But they could have gone E, G, C, F because we're moving in fourths. And F is the tritone substitution for that B chord. So that would have been. Um, yeah. Which in certain contexts would work. That's known as the Tad Dameron turnaround. If you do that with jazz chords, you get this. Which is actually quite a lovely turnaround. Um, so this is a great way. Of course, the biggest problem, I, I might make one of these for every key. Because... Uh, it's just a great tool for like, if you're writing a chord progression and you have a, a movement in fourths, so you might want to decide to change one of those chords up. So if you got a B going to E, you might decide F to E. So for example, in the key of E, you have an F sharp minor, which is the two. You have the B, which is the five. So a normal two five would be. But 
but you might find that a little too plain vanilla. So maybe we'll go F sharp minor and instead of B, we go 180 degrees across to F and we get. Right. So those are the possibilities for this sort of thing. Mm. So I shouldn't have closed that up. <laughs> but, you know, as, as regards like vertical harmony, meaning, I mean, uh, horizontal harmony, meaning how the. Uh, how the chords move to each other. I, you know, I thought there's not much else here until I. Begin to examine. Just really cool. And again, one of those things that the Beatles, apparently they did this once. I can't think of another song where they used oblique motion a second in harmonizing. And not only that, I thought, okay, well, this this is an example of oblique motion, and again, I will explain in a second. But all right, I thought, okay, done. Well, there's that oblique motion, and then I decided to listen to the commands, thinking, well, maybe there's something here. I doubt it. Turned out that's oblique motion as well. Holy crap! Like it reminds me a little bit of you know how uh, uh, you won't see me. He has all those lines, lines in it, like it was consciously done to create. It's also like this is oblique. So let's get into what is oblique motion. Um, all right. So I drew up a little chart here to give you a visual idea. Okay. So here's the contour of a melody. You know, this note could be E, there could be G, there could be F sharp, you know, and so on and so forth, right? And this is just the shape of the melody, how it goes up and down. There's something called parallel motion. And this, this you get out of classical theory. Like when you're analyzing Bach, you learn about all this stuff. This is parallel motion. Now, the red line is a harmony to the original melody. OK, so now you can harmonize underneath in parallel. And normally that would be in thirds or sixths. A six is an inverted third, so it has the same effect as a third. OK, now here the melody is below. The harmony is below the original melody. Here it could be above it. Now. All right, now contrary motion. Is you're literally doing a mirror, and in fact, I think they use the term mirror sometimes when they refer to this, but here's your original melody and what you want to do is the reverse with the with the harmony. Now, this isn't going to get you all those thirds that, that you could get with this or six because you've got to jump around and you have got to be aware of what chord your note is hitting. Now, now, this particular two categories here, there are two types. One is precise and one is general. In other words, I could go precisely following. In other words, if this goes up a fourth, this has to go up a fourth. This goes down a major second. This has to go down some kind of second. All right. Could be met depending on the on what degree of the scale you're on, but it must be some form of, of a second depending on the scale stuff. OK, but you can also do this so you're hitting a chord tone that's not exactly a third. It's not exact. You know, in other words, you're just kind of following the general shape, but not going exact parallel. Right. You're going down when it goes down, but not the same yeah. amount necessarily. Right, exactly. And this is true for the contrary motion. In fact, it'd be more likely to happen in contrary motion because you really got to search for tones. And this is a very, very classical thing here. Now, oblique motion is a lot simpler. Here's your original melody. And here is a pedal point, which is a pedal point is just the same note. And it's that note is repeating throughout the entirety of this. So you could have it at the bottom, below the melody, or above the melody. And uh, interestingly, we have an example of this and this in Please Please Me. Mind blowing. Uh, let me see. All right, so let's look at these now. Here's this, I never usually do staff, but I decided to do actual staff for this. This is. Da, 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 and this is da, 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 right? Okay. 
okay? Uh, so, in other words, if you were doing solfege, there'd be do, do, ti, la, sol, la, sol, mi, la, sol, and this is just going do, 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 do. All right, for all you dodo birds out there. All right, now, <laughs> what blew me away is when I looked into the come on, come on, the echo. There's John's come on, come on and then there's Paul and George singing the, the, the uh, response, right? This is really interesting because now we have the opposite situation where the pedal point tone is remaining below the melody, not above it like here. And so we get, uh, let me see if I could do this. Uh, and you could hear that all the way through. Now, again, this is one thing I always say is the Beatles were very aware of what chord they were on when they were singing harmonies. These two notes, it's not arbitrary. It's not like, okay, I'm just going to go up the scale while you stay on the same note. There's more to it than that. Uh, when we look at an A major chord, this is C sharp, which is the third of A major. This is E, which is the fifth of the A major chord. Here, this note becomes the fifth of the F sharp minor chord, which would be C sharp again. And F sharp is the root of the F sharp minor chord. They go up a step here. Turns out that this uh, G sharp note is the fifth of the C sharp minor chord and the C sharp here is now is the root. And then finally we get to here again and we're on C sharp which is the third of the A major chord and this A is the root of the A major chord. The uh, it's it's just remarkable that this happens and notice this the excitement it generates. really really builds up it's just so wonderful you're you're exactly right the the harmonies in that come on come on part is so infectiously enthusiastically fun and i it's one of those things where i always know um because my wife is the least musical person i've ever known in my life so when she catches on to something and she'll randomly sing something you know it's got to be really memorable and this is one of those things that and my children too. Everyone knows this. Come on, come on, come on, come on. It's just, it's absolutely enthusiastically infectious and it works so well here. And here's, okay, so here's the thing. Here, here's me admitting again how just musically stupid and ignorant and un, un, uh, observant I am. So it was only a few years ago that I ever started to consciously notice Paul's harmony in the verse, the oblique motion there um I, I never noticed he was holding that same note and i was and when i noticed that i'm like oh well that's i didn't expect that's weird that's well, that's cool i guess but now i can't not listen to that i can't not hear that paul is just singing the same note and honestly i don't enjoy that <laughs> i'm like i want some movement there i want something i just the seems... fact that you cannot sorry Wait, wait, what, what, what part, what part of that don't you? So know? on the, uh, the on the, the yeah, the the verse part, the uh, uh, last night I said these, that part, I don't like the oblique motion oh. there, but in the come on, come on part, I love the oblique motion, and then the yeah, so that's the other part. When I, uh, you might remember from our, one of our lessons recently, I was trying to solfege the uh, th this song, and when I got to that part. For some reason, I wasn't listening to the song. I was just in my head trying to audiate it. And I I didn't realize John was doing oblique. It, it feels to me like John is moving, but he is not. It is the same note that he is keeping, but it feels well, like movement just because of the other movement that's going on. It's, it's really strange. Uh, John, wait, uh, let's, let's get clear on this, because John sings it. Come on. Uh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come, come. Wait, come on. Oh, I guess. Wow. Yeah, yeah. All right. John is hitting the same note. Uh, 
uh, the harmony in this case, George is the one that's hitting the, the same note over and over again. And Paul is changing up on top. Ah, on the, on right. The, on the response. Right. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's the harmony is separating them. Yeah. Did you did yeah. you have that in your staff? Because it looked like they were hitting the same note in the harmony. Uh, let's take a look at it again. All right. Which part are we talking about? This? Nope. Come on. Come on. Oh, okay. I this is just the I don't have John's part. Ah, oh, okay. Is, right, 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 right. Gotcha, gotcha. But George is hitting the same note and Paul is moving up. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you think about it, uh, come on, come on, come on, come on. All of John's notes are the same exact ones as as, as George's notes. Yep. Yep. So basically, George is just echoing John. Yeah, yep. like that's later. that's part of. Yeah, it's it's so simple, but it's so complex in a way. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. And again, you know, that's the lesson you get from the Beatles when you really look into. It's like going into a mine and you're thinking all you're seeing is coal and then all of a sudden there's a beautiful diamond, you know. It's, it's like, all diamonds. <laughs> I thought it was all it's coal. All it's all diamonds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. That there's it's almost like an auditory illusion or something. Like you feel there's movement going on when in fact it's more oblique than you thought. Yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah, and the, the and the nature of the chords too for some reason. I mean, I wouldn't probably naturally think of that chord progression on my own like if I was writing a song but uh, for some reason that does build up now that makes me wonder if there's a diatonic line in there no there isn't oh wait da, 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 da. there's a diatonic line in there so we're instinctively feeling a rise without knowing it right mm, yeah because the, the line is buried inside the chords you know wow that was that was an epiphany right in the moment i hadn't realized that beautiful nice yeah, yeah no but that that but then, absolutely you're exactly right you're definitely feeling that everything about that is such a build-up it's such a build yeah up in every sense yeah uh it almost you know really i mean it's kind of like musically it's almost orgasmic the way it builds up and uh which is interesting because you know if you look at the lyrics please please me what does he mean by that <laughs> <laughs> like I please you. Oh, <laughs> mm, sounds like someone's giving but not oh, getting. Oh man, yeah, I could tell you stories too. If my <laughs> <laughs> I won't. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you're right. The, I, I, you know, it's not I, honestly. I mean, g juvenile giggles aside. I mean, there is it, it. There is something to that. It is obviously like so much rock and roll. There's the wink and the nudge towards the sexual connotations that aren't being explicitly stated. That's kind of part of the excitement of the music, right? That it was part of the yeah, generation you know gap yeah. that helped to separate the generations. It got more and more explicit and less and less. I mean, <laughs> eventually it ends up at cherry pie. <laughs> but it started <laughs> off as the kind of sly wink and a nudge to something, you know, different. And there, yes, yeah, indeed. that's built into the music in a sense. It's orgasmic in a sense. It's the buildup. Right. And, you know, there's something uh, almost subliminal. You can understand why all these girls were screaming and literally having orgasms while they're screaming. I, I, <laughs> literally? <laughs> they literally? They literally did. That's really the truth. These girls, some of these girls were having orgasms. I have a theory about this, that the reason why the whole love thing became big in the 60s, all these women were just gushing love out, out into the world and it just became a vibe, you know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you know, um, from my experience, if you look at sexual language from a from a male point of view and a female point of view, men are very overt. They talk about direct body parts and can be very kind of crass about it, whereas women uh, are more inch, more turned on by the metaphor, by the suggestion of something sexual than an actual overt reference to it. 
And there, therein lies a seductive, seductive quality of Beatles music, you know, that, you know, there was that wink, wink, nudge, nudge. They knew what they were talking about, you know, and they knew they couldn't come out and say it. But they, I think they also knew from their experience in Hamburg that these women knew exactly what they were talking about. Or if they didn't, they understood it at a subliminal level, you know. So, um, so my general observation about the musicality of this song is that this song consists of three elements to me. When I try to think of this song, I think of the, the hook, the original hook, the harmonica, you know. Do, 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 do. And um, I think of the mini tag, I think, as you called it, the G-A-B. Uh, every time that's stated, oh, right, right. that's so, it's so prominent and everything drops out and it's da 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 that's such a important part of that that moment and the come on come oh, on yeah. build up is it, that's the three elements of this song everything else and and the ending i guess the ending also really sticks out but the the actual right, the last ending. night i said these words to my is peculiarly kind of uninteresting in a sense musically harmonically lyrically it's just kind of like bland porridge but everything else is the spice the sugar that makes this song really pop I, I totally get what you're saying. I, I will say I kind of disagree about the verses. I find them exciting and interesting because of that oblique motion, because you can get away with this dissonance. Oops. That you can get away with it. And to me, there's something very pleasing about that line. I, 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 so for me, but I totally get what you're saying on the on the same token. I I, I see where where you know like these highlights are there. I get that. Um, yeah. So I I've said all I can about the music theory. I just want to like really kind of give a shout out. I don't know if you listen to to the drums in this, but to me it was Ringo saying, "Oh, you didn't think I was a good drummer, <laughs> Mr. Morton? Well, check this out." And he kills it. Mm -hmm. He's killing it on yeah. this track. Yeah. Ringo uh, really brings out, especially that ending. And yeah, he's all over this track. Yeah, for sure. He is totally killing it. Uh, really, really great, great drums in this. And again, you know, you feel the enthusiasm. You really feel it. I think that was part of the big attraction of the Beatles in those days was the energetic output. They were, they just love what they were doing so much and they just wanted to put it out there and people picked up on that. They just felt it. Uh, on that note, do you have anything to say about that mini tag? Um, obviously, we said parallel relative switch. Oh, I, you know, well, it, uh, one thing I will say is kind of a foreshadowing of rock to come. All right, because the parallel relative switch, ju just using major chords alone, became a big thing with later bands like The Who and Cream and all these other big, loud bands, you know. So this, you go, you know, or I'm not your stepping stone, the monkey song. So uh, yeah, yeah, that was a precursor to what was going to start happening. As soon as, as soon as musicians began to hear this thing, this is the left side of the circle of fifths chords, right? As soon as they hear those alternatives, they're like, wow, this is this is really cool. I like this sound. And so they exploited that a bunch. And uh, what about the so it's the same it's the same mini tag chord wise, but it's the five note riff that George plays. I assume George. Do 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 do. Oh, that. Yeah. What is real that? simple? Yeah. It's, like, it's just an octave to E to E. To a fifth, so it's kind of like a power chord, okay. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Again, very yeah, effective, but way, extremely simple, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I noticed is the song starts on it on a pickup. One, two, three, four. And it's very, very subtle, but he does it's either a hammer on or a slide. Right? So yeah, he does that. That's a little a little bit of Harrison touch there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the long and short of it. I can't think of anything much else. I think um, 
some of the bass work, there are these moments inside of this song where you could hear Paul's future, his brilliance. There's one particular line, I forget where it is. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't remember where inside it is, but uh, it's, it's, it's cool. I, I, you know, I gave you the, uh, the video of that guy doing a version of it, the cover version of the song. I'm pretty sure he replicates everything, but I wouldn't know where to mm, okay. tell you All right. it is. Well, we will direct people to that cover if they're interested. Uh, Paul Moody, 25, yeah. does a good cover that uh, he shows all the different parts. Yes, and uh, since we're nearing the end of our little session here, um, session, uh, just uh, wanted to mention uh, to my viewers, please keep your eyes out because we're, uh, we're going to do a kind of special multicast, me, James, and... Uh, Matt Williamson from the really cool channel uh, Pop Goes the 60s, where he uh, not only discusses kind of the innards of the Beatles' relationships with each other uh, based on the Nagra reels, but just British pop in general of that time and the pop music of the era, early to late 60s. Um, and I want to make a comment here that I don't think Matt has heard me uh, say, but like I've I've analyzed the obviously analyzed the pop music of that era, especially mid to late '60s, and the writing, the composition is so remarkable that it should have been elevated to the level, the status of jazz music. Granted, it's different than jazz music; it's more about the composition than it is about the uh, the improv and all like that. But some of these chord movements are so creative and so remarkable. That's why I'm glad that, that, that Matt has his channel, because this is something that needs to be looked at. It's really important stuff. It's, you know, it shouldn't go down the memory hole. It's too good for that to happen. So, Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. yeah well, anything we'll else fun, to like, say before we start wrapping it up here? I, uh, nothing's coming to mind. I'm sure it will after we wrap. But, yeah. You know. All right. Well, then, just to set the table for our next singles conversation, the next single in chronological order will be From Me to You slash Thank You Girl. So we will choose one of those songs. All right. Both All good right. songs. I look forward to them. I'm, you know, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> in ways, I'm, I'm more interested in looking at the earlier material than the later, only because, well, their sophistication, it's understood in, in the later period. But the early stuff really needs to get recognized for how good that is, too. It really does. And yeah, it's cute pop music, but the blood, sweat, and tears that went into it. And, early stuff. And the rapidity with which they did this. I mean, it's incredible how quickly they were writing and recording this stuff. Yes, indeed. It's like, wow. Yeah, it's, it's really remarkable. Again, you know, they're snatching a little bit of time in a hotel room or in the van, you know, like, you know, when you consider every, talk about limitations, everything was against them and they just broke through it all. It was meant to be. It was meant to be either that or, you know, uh, Theodora Adorno wrote all of their <laughs> music in his Yeah, we're, we're definitely giving fodder to that. See, they didn't really <laughs> write it. All right. Anyway, I think we'll wrap it up here then. <laughs> Sounds good, James. Thanks for joining me tonight. And uh, yeah, take care, everyone. I had a great time. I hope you did too. <laughs>